Okay. Uh, so yeah. Um, all right, here's here's for YouTube. Here's my little intro. Hi, my name's Alex. If you don't know about me, ask Jim or Ben. Uh, I'm saxophone teacher, audio guy extraordinaire of some capacity. Um, <laughs> in the if, if at some point you end up watching this video, probably you're trying to learn something about the soundboard or how you know the sound works here in this uh, in worship. So um, I figure we'll give a little quick demo about how that works. Um, the way you should think about it, new person, is that this is pretend like the air, your area of worship here is like the kitchen, and your speakers, your mixer, uh, your microphones are kind of like the appliances in your kitchen. They all have their quirks. They all kind of do different things. Um, but the main thing is, I was hoping to tell some folks today, is that you shouldn't be scared of it. Uh, it's just you have to play around with it. You kind of have to cook the wrong meal and use the wrong spices first and kind of understand what is gonna, what, how it works and uh, how to make the best of everything and how to, how to actually improve uh, audio quality, etc. and how worship runs. So, um, so today Ben just told me, okay, we got some issues with the subwoofer, not making any noise. Uh, things sound a little fizzy in here. We're gonna go through in all the little bits and try to diagnose what's happening here. Um, so I guess, yes, talking with, with setup, I did watch a couple of YouTube videos. I, I found your channel, my church account, and I subscribed to it. Um, and so I was like, okay, we have a consistent setup having, you know, left, right speakers. Yep. Um, for our newer to audio folks, usually a great, uh, setup for speakers is 2.1. 2.1 is like a shorthand for it, which is exactly what we have here. Oh, it's just be a left speaker, so essentially on your left, like your left ear, and then a right speaker way down there on your right side. And uh, the point one refers to this guy, the subwoofer. Um, so, basics of how this stuff works this is a low frequency sort of speaker, it only takes low frequencies um, and just kicks them out. And is not, if you try to pump a lot of high notes, high end through this, it will just not sound right. It's not designed for that. It's meant to be used in conjunction with like a main left, right, left, right sort of speaker system, if you will. Uh, so what's cool about that is you can, uh, what's great about a 2.1 system versus just like a left and a right speaker, or even just a one speaker system, is that you can get what's called stereo spread. So if you think about when you're listening to headphones, you have music on, you can hear the different instruments on the left and right sort of sides of your ears. Uh, that's stereo spread. That means stuff is being panned or being pushed to either the left speaker, your left headphone, or your right headphone. So we actually have that happening right here in worship. We have a left speaker and a right speaker. Um, the point one for your subwoofers, again, low frequencies only. Low frequencies don't, doesn't really matter where you put them. Usually by default, they're put in the middle. So which we have this subwoofer in the middle, which is the right placement for it. Um, subwoofers are really temperamental in that the way they respond, the way you feel the low frequencies completely dependent upon the construction of it and as well as where it goes in the room. So as you can see, before I even came in, they already had the speaker set right in the middle here, which I think is a one of the best places to put it because um, you're not gonna get overpowering low end. The low end is able to go around the speaker. If you think of um, the way, if you know all about physics, there's a little physics lesson here. Um, the way sound works is essentially, the higher the frequency, the more directional it is, like a laser beam. The lower the frequency or the lower the pitch, the like circular it goes. So this subwoofer, even though it's kicking out low end and the speaker is actually faced this way, the low frequencies are actually traveling all around for the most part, most, mostly in this general direction, but also this way. They just kick out. That's just how it, it works. They essentially travel throughout the, the enclosure, and you can hear that. That's why it works to have it in the middle. Most movie theaters um, and professional sort of studio atmospheres will usually have a subwoofer in the middle because it really doesn't matter too much. The, the sound's going to travel everywhere. That's why they're also be under the floor in a movie theater. Um, Let's see, where should we go for next? Um, so we got large diameter speakers in our main, our main left and right. This is really great for high volume. Um, I don't think this will be important to you guys, but if the, if the speakers ever get changed out, you want to keep this similar size. Um, there's usually a good correlation between the quality of sound. As you get louder, usually the diameter of the actual speaker inside should get a little bigger. Um, 
but that's not always the case. Obviously, it's only so big that you see speakers, you only know, get the standard sizes are usually about 12 or 15 inches for a, like a mid speaker or the main speaker of like a standard PA system like what we have here. Um, so th these are the right size. This is going to be good for loud. This is going to sound great. It's going to have plenty of low end, plenty of bottom, as, especially now we have a subwoofer in conjunction with it as well. So uh, we're going to go through and figure out, see if we can diagnose and do some self correcting as to why these aren't working. Um, for notes on setup for the future, we could consider moving these left and right. So one of the problems we have with having a left and right speaker back behind where everybody's gonna talk and do their thing and use microphones is you can get feedback. It's not always gonna happen, but sometimes can happen. So what can happen is if the microphone is here, it's gonna pick up sound from this direction. So you theoretically have sound kind of coming out sideways of your left and right and being picked up by this microphone. Mm -hmm. And if you've experienced feedback, you kind of, there's like this really high frequency start to go, well, it oscillates and can go crazy. Sometimes it's really low frequency, so maybe a subwoofer can kind of create uh, oscillation and feedback as well. Um, so a quick note, that, well, again, the one thing I would maybe change, maybe, is to maybe move the subwoofer back just a little bit so you could couple with the back wall to give that low end projection make it a little bigger sounding, and then moving the speakers forward a little bit, um, just so that way you're less prone to feedback. Or option number three is to make sure everybody's standing way behind the speakers. Ideally, if you wanna turn the camera, yep. you know, but this is not to scale obviously, but you wanna be, have your microphones behind and shooting away from any sort of speakers. Even mm. like a wedge monitor that may be on the floor. If it's right here, let's pretend this plants my wedge monitor. Um, if, it sh if my microphone is here pointing at it, it's going to get crazy feedback. If, if the same signal is put through the monitor that's coming out into the microphone, you'll get this crazy oscillation feedback sound really bad. So if you look at professional stages, usually wedge monitors will be on the ground angled up. And then uh, microphones are usually angled directly against the monitor wedge to give the most possible rejection. Um, Microphones usually only pick up a certain area. They don't pick up all 360 direct, all of the directions of sound unless they're designed to do that. But I think all the microphones you're gonna have in this context are gonna be somewhat directional and they're going to be picking up only where they're supposed to be picking up, which would be in front of the microphone. So you can position microphones and speakers so they're kind of facing away from each other and you're less likely to get feedback. So other than that, it looks really good. We have a centrally located snake. Um, and uh, so, I guess before we get into, I'll, I'll start, we'll maybe diagnose as like part two or second part of this video. Let's go talk about the, the mixer real quick. Um, just to have a little introduction. I couldn't catch this, your computer, because your password. Oh, okay. Okay, so as of, uh, you know, May 2021, we're using this year mixer, Soundcraft mixer, and a computer. Um, really awesome, perfect way to do it. This is probably the most intimidating part about you know doing this volunteer work as a live audio person is this mixer with this, all the crazy knobs. You know when you're doing your day to day thing, you're not necessarily going to see interact with an object like this piece of equipment that looks this complicated. It looks really complicated. Um, when I was uh, when I was younger, I used to be like, "What the heck is that? I, I don't want to do that. Looks, that looks really crazy." But the good news is that mixers, when you learn one, you kind of learn them all. So with, I I haven't seen this mixer in I don't know, over a year, year and a half, probably. And so, but I can still use it because I have not um, because I know exactly what all the functions do. I can just tell by the words, the layout. It's very consistent. Um, this was called the analog mixer. So when you do something on the board, when you move an knob, when you touch a fader, when you do something, stuff usually happens or will stay the same unless you manually change it. Um, nowadays, they also make digital mixers, which can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes that look like this, or like a smaller version of this, or even ones that go in like an audio rack that are like wirelessly controlled like a phone or a tablet. Um, so this is a, it's an analog console. All analog consoles usually look somewhat like this, where it's essentially of tons and tons of knobs and faders at the bottom. Some consoles are smaller and usually have like smaller knobs. They might not have a whole sectional faders because this does take up a lot of space.
but they're, they essentially all do the same job. If you see a mixer, if the next, next mixer is smaller, doesn't have faders, it works exact same way. Um, so um, the good news about mixers is that it's really, in this case, 24 copies of one thing and then a master section or separate section. So essentially it's this section and then like one of these rows here, one of these vertical rows, it's essentially a duplicate of all the same things. So if you learn one strip, you can like cover up all these. Oops, did it distract? If you just learn how one channel strip works, you learn how they all work, which is really nice, really handy. Um, so the most common feature you're gonna use are your mute button. Think of mute as like an on-off switch, and these ones have light sound, which is really nice. I like that. Um, the master fader, these guys down at the bottom, these are usually your default controls when you're actually doing worship, you're actually listening how loud something is and quiet something is. Usually this is what you're gonna end up playing with, is these guys right here. So don't be afraid of these sliders. Um, most of the knobs are gonna be end up pre, gonna be preset for you, either by me, by Ben, whoever's here today on you guys, um, and we'll talk about how you would set these knobs and that sort of thing. Um, very common fares to look for is each of your channels. So each of these little strips kind of divided up by these vertical lines are called channel strips. And so they all do this, about the same sort of job. They take a signal from the back, you plug in with the cable, it kind of goes down this direction and then towards the master. So these guys over here, like your master faders, ooh, See what we just did there? This is our mix control, so our master, as labeled right now. And so I'm essentially turning up what we have here. And here's our a little meter telling us what's going on with our master fader. So we'll turn that off for now. Um, but all of these kind of come down, all your inputs, all your sound sources, each individual one comes down this way, gets mixed. <laughs> That's where the mixer part comes from. The main mix comes here. Then it'll go out the master section and then over to your speakers when everything's working properly and that sort of thing. Um, okay. In addition to these faders being essentially volume controls, these knobs are all volume controls for the most part. They're all volume controls. So, okay, you have this, mat, this, this big fader here, it's supposed to be volume control. What do these other things do? They're all sub volumes, they do different things. Um, the way I think of it is start to start top down, because this is the order the signal kind of travels in. So starting at the top, all these knobs that say gain, what does gain mean? Gain is volume, gain is signal. Um, it's essentially just another sort of volume control. It's, it's how much signal the mixer takes in. So um, if you have a louder, louder singer, you wanna take less signal in because the, the sound being given by the loud singer is plenty. But if you have somebody who's whispering really quietly, you're gonna wanna turn the gain knob up so that way you get a little more balance. And then, um, you can sometimes monitor how much signal you're taking in. And uh, there's a solo button around here. Let's see. Aha, here we go. So these, if you see these PFL buttons, this stands for pre-fader listen. Pre-fader listen, each channel strip. And what pre-fader listen is, is being before the signal hits the actual fader, it's, it's being monitored. Essentially the level is being monitored with these kind of graphs here. So if we were taking in a signal from this channel strip and we set our gain, we want to set how much, see how much level we're taking in the mixer. You can hit pre-fader listen and uh, turn that on and off. So in this case, we have some music playing through this channel strip and it's uh, coming in pretty hot. So one thing I'm thinking of is, hmm, maybe we can take this, this signal down quite a bit. So I'm going to reduce the gain knob. And if you watch this, see how these lights are all going down? The, the more lights you see, the louder it is. So let's take it down a bit, take it down. That's pretty good. You know, just a little bit is pretty good. If you look on your meters, you have this little zero here, usually getting things around a marked sort of unity gain or zero meter or reading is pretty good. Uh, that's about where you wanna keep stuff or you're bringing signals in. So uh, since that signal was too hot, it was getting way up here. And you might think, well, seems like you wanna bring a lot of signal in, right? That makes sense. If you bring in too much signal, you get these, uh, these red lights to pop up. This is not good, this is danger zone. You're probably having noise issues at this point because this is now clipping. Clipping is a, means distortion. So we're bringing in so much signal from uh, Ben's computer now that we're actually distorting this channel strip. Hmm. We're actually distorting it. So that's why I brought this level down 
bringing it down to about unity gain or so. And that's where we want to keep stuff. So notice how the signal is now kind of jumping up and down as stuff gets louder and quieter. That's what we want to see. And we want to leave plenty of real estate up at the top, but not too little. So like if it's if it's down probably about here, eh, you could probably bring some more in. That's a that's a cool, that's many, many dB of real estate. So if you can keep it around zero or just tap under zero, that's usually pretty good. Um, famous records in the old days are famous for taking too much signal into the console. Um, for example, there's a Beatles song, it's, I think it's called Revolution, where the guitar sounds really broken and nasty. That's where the Beatles took their guitars, they plugged in the back of their mixer and turned the input gain up on the mixer all the way up probably. And it just sounds like mush and sounds like staticky and completely gross. And for them it worked, but that was a big no-no back in the day. That's what you wanted to avoid. So it's a similar concept. We want to avoid topping out our meters anywhere, whether it's on a signal channel, it's on the whole mix, it's our master bus. We want to avoid make, having this go all the way up. Ooh, that's pretty loud. So um, that's our gain control. Next, our gain control. We got a volume control. You have this little button that's with like a kind of fraction mark. It's oh, or what's the thing? Is it power? Which I think what's the math term for that? Anyway, it's like a fraction sort of mark. A bar. It's got a sound to 100 hertz on it. HZ for hertz. Uh, what does that mean? This is a low cut filter. This is a very common feature of analog mixers. And all this does, it's like a bass removal switch. If something sounds muddy, usually by default, that's what you want, want to use. This little switch and these knobs all go together. This is a, called an equalizer. An equalizer takes different ranges of the audio spectrum that we can hear and it sorts them out for you and allows you to control different elements of a sound. Um, so we're going to move on to this in just a little bit. We're going to say this kind of for last because there'll be some homework involved with this. All right, coming up to our EQ, this is our going to change the sound, edit the sound as, well, as much as we want. Then we go down to our AUG section. So um, looks like this is being used for monitoring. This is very popular use. AUG sections are essentially like sets of these faders here. There's actually computer software where they have the main mix as these faders, and they have little tiny faders up top in a software called Pro Tools, for example, that are look like they're essentially AUG sends. Instead of them being faders, they're these little knobs. But this is what really throws people off. These, these little knobs and these faders essentially are doing the same job. All they're doing is we're taking a mix of all of our different sounds, we're combining them together, and we're sending them out a different output. So aux, auxiliary sending, aux one, two, three, and four. This is like four extra mixes we can do uh, of our sound. We actually have well, we've got six mixes here. So six potential other mixes we can make. So with this one mixer, you can have mix seven different sounds or seven different full mixes or full band sounds if you'd like to using all these different auxiliary mixes. Now your main mix is always gonna be at the bottom. It's always gonna be with, usually with faders, but your uh, auxiliary mixes are usually a little, bit, a little higher in the strip with knobs. Usually have a little less control dependent upon each mixer. All these guys are just level controls. So um, in the, hopefully at some point you guys have a band and if, if you have monitor wedges so the band can hear themselves play or hear others play, they'll, they'll probably tell you what they would like to do. So say we want more of our lead singer and our lead singer is on, uh, the, our, 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 uh, our drummer's monitor is essentially on auxiliary channel one. And we want more of our lead singer. Let's pretend on our end strip here that this is our lead singer. We would turn them up in auxiliary channel one. And because we did that here, the drummer will now hear our lead singer through the output of this in his monitor. Well, we, without just usually hearing it through the main house left, right, and subwoofer. So think of this as like all your monitor wedge control volumes here. That pretty much occupies all this section. Oh, let's skip forward a little bit. The pan control, usually this is the like lowest knob on your set of uh, your channel strip knobs. So there's all this, uh, this guy down here. Usually they're set in the middle by default, which is fantastic. I, I walked in, didn't have to touch anything. Mostly everything is panned straight up. And you notice how the, if you look at the actual numbering of this knob, it says zero and then it goes one, two, three, four, five to the left and to the right. A pan control is a left, so left speaker, right speaker, amount mix. So uh, we're gonna see if we can have a little bit of this sound coming through. 
Now over the video, you're not going to be able to hear this, but in the room, what we're hearing is we're hearing the sound of the track, the, the song, going back and forth between the left speaker and moving over, now completely in the right speaker. So let's, we, let's go a shot of the knob as well. So here's all the way to the right. Here's straight up in, de in the middle, which again, it's probably hard to hear over video. All the way over to the left. So pan control is really great for band mixing. If we, if we have two guitar players per se, we might wanna say, okay, instead of having all the instruments right up the middle here, hitting equally on both sides, maybe to make it this band sound bigger, you could take one guitar player, maybe let's pretend this is our first guitarist, we can put their sound only going through the left main speaker, and then maybe we could take our second guitarist, oops, let's use a, let's, let's do that on this channel strip here, actually. Okay, let's bring this our first guy, going to the left side, and then the right, I'm actually gonna use me like that, there we go. And then our second guitar player, we're gonna put him on the right side. So this channel strip says, okay, 100% of the left guitar player's sound, first guitar player, is gonna come through the left speaker only, and no sound will go through the right speaker. And for this guitar player, 100% of this guitar player's sound will go through the right speaker only. So now if we have both of them playing together, you're gonna hear one guitar on this side, one guitar on this side, and it's gonna sound big. It sound like, oh, maybe, maybe one person standing or one person standing over there. It's gonna sound really interesting and oh, what's called a wide. So a wide mix, usually things are hard pan. It's like having one guitar player over here, completely over here, one guitar player over here. And if you notice on these pan knobs, we have all these, this sort of gray area. So if we don't, we want a lot of our guitar player over on one side, but not all the way over in case somebody is sitting very far over there and wants to, we want to hear both guitar players if we're staying on one side. You don't have to go so far, maybe like halfway or just a little bit uh, around that sort of area. You can get that sense of spread without completely getting rid of the sound of all the instruments. So if you're sitting in the very front corner, left corner, you're not missing out on any of the instrument sounds. If, but unless you, uh, but if you do pan all the way over to the right, you would miss out on that instrument. So this is a, a variable control. This is really powerful tool for studio recording um, and like professional music mixing. The pan tool is very powerful for a live sound use. Not as big of a deal. Not as big of a deal, especially with this spread of a setup, where the two speakers are very far away from each other. There's people sitting very wide. If everybody was sitting kind of in the middle, which is like the sweet spot, so you're hearing equal amounts of both the left speaker sound and the right speaker sound, this pan control could be very cool. It can give a sort of wider effect to whoever you're hearing. However, because everybody is so spread out in this space, going that extreme with the pan control probably won't be that useful. You might actually want to go very, very, very mild with it, if not use it at all, because Odds are folks might only hear sound out of one speaker when they're in the room. Maybe it'll be super quiet if they're sitting over here, they will barely hear the right speaker. So that's a, a judgment call you guys as a church can make. You can say, oh, how loud and how wide, how wide do we want our, uh, our mixes, our tracks, whatever it may be, to sound. Um, so, but again, as this, like I said before, everything is a volume control. All this does is it reduces the volume from one speaker and adds it to the other one, vice versa. It's kind of like two of these guys working back and forth together. Alrighty, um, real basically, that's the gist of your channel strip. There's a couple extra features we're gonna go into in just a second. Um, the, you won't have to really deal with as much, this be more for setting the board up, but as, as, as far as a daily use, we're gonna talk about EQ in just a second, but that's the main control is again, this pan control, which will probably set and forget. Maybe on the day you'll make a to change it and then leave it. But most of the time you're gonna be using your mute controls, probably your gain controls. If you have new sound sources, you're like, or new singers coming in, new instruments coming in, you'll probably use these a lot, your master faders um, on each strip. So that's mostly what you're gonna use. Uh, maybe we'll make a part two where we talk about the equalizer because this is a little more complicated. It will require some homework. For you guys. All right, uh, next, that's kind of like half of the battle. Just one of these guys is half the battle. You kind of almost learned the mixer. Most of what we do now is now go to the master section. Um, it's called the master section because it's essentially the control of everything. So may, this, uh, this fader here that says mix, usually that's overall house. Today you've have a label such. It's the overall volume of both speakers 
uh, in both, uh, both left and right in one knob. Oftentimes you may see um, mixers where this will be two faders, so like a left main left side, main right side, very, very common. But what's kind of nice about this one is it makes everything equal. It's just one, one, uh, one fader, you don't have to worry about it too much. In this case, we have this little C mix here. So we're using this for our subwoofer. We're gonna troubleshoot this in a little bit, but this is essentially a control of how loud or soft our subwoofer would be. And then continuing on upwards, it's essentially the same thing. We have master volume controls, master faders for each of our auxiliary sends or each of our six available sub mixes. Remember our mixes from these channel strips before, we set these how we want them, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is the master level control. So if you want to mute them all, you just turn it all down and you've essentially negated this mix from being heard, et cetera. So this is a good master volume for a monitor wedge. If somebody, when the band is up playing, they have, you guys are using wedges and they say, hey, I want more of everything. Everything's too quiet. You take, just go to the master knob, turn it up a little bit. Super easy, super, super easy. Uh, and essentially there's just a few variants of that. We have a effects return section. Not gonna be super useful to you guys. You don't have really any outboard effects right now, so you don't have to worry about that so much. Um, headphone output for monitoring. So if you were listening uh, with headphones on, you're mixing that way, this is your level for that. Talkback control. If you ever see talkback, usually it indicates a separate channel in the mixer with a talkback microphone plugged in. And what a talkback microphone is used for is essentially for the person standing here at the desk saying, uh, hey, so-and-so, uh, can you check your mic, please? And essentially, it's a very, very simple stripped-down version of a channel strip because it's not actually going to be used during a performance, during a, during a worship service, etc. It's just designed for the engineer to say, hey, so-and-so, can you check your mic, please? Or uh, I need more of this, more of that, that sort of thing. It's just a very, very simple channel strip. So uh, in this setting, I don't see you guys using that much. And if you guys get a... Maybe you do like a headphone system. You're able to communicate with everybody through headphones. You're a little complicated. This one, that's where something like a talkback control might be useful. Well, you can also just use a channel strip for essentially the same job. Uh, but this the talkback control is a quick and dirty way to kind of run with it. Alrighty, so this, that kind of concludes part one. That's a very basic sort of thing. Um, in general, for most of you, this will, you kind of just have to get in here and play with it. We're going to talk about your homework and playing with Mixer in part two of this video. Um, so say, see if what Ben wants to cut it here or not. But to summarize, don't worry about the whole board. Think of it as one, the same thing, many times over. You may only need one, one channel and the master volume up. That might be all you need to do depending on the circumstances. So it's not so bad, uh, the mixer part. And then we'll, we'll let's go ahead and head on to part two. All right. All right, welcome back to, I guess this would be like part two or so, maybe part three of this video. We're talking about the basics of mixers, which are way worse than they actually are. Really easy. Hopefully you uh, can see that by the last video we did. Um, now we're going to talk about the equalizer section. I kind of skipped over that. That's this sort of grayed out area at the top of each strip. So we're going to focus kind of just on one, one of these guys and go from there. Uh, we're going to kind of say why this is can scare you because it seems intimidating. There's a lot of controls and there's a lot of kind of abbreviations for things. It's kind of, what the heck is happening here? Um, and this was a mystery to me, but if you learn your equalizer, boy, it can really help add the extra little bit of spice to your dish or the extra special sauce or make things sound really fantastic. However, if used incorrectly, they can also make things sound really, really bad. Alrighty, so this, this ideally, this section of the board, when in default position, all the knobs should be pointed directly up. All directly up. That when if they're all directly up, it means essentially it's not doing anything. And to double check that it's not doing anything, <coughs> you can also turn the equalizer off with this little EQ button. This is like a little on-off switch here. So uh, by default, I would leave all the knobs in the middle and with the EQ knob essentially up, which is gonna be off. Um, that will essentially bypass this section of the board. If there's noise being created, maybe that maybe by the equalizer bypassing, it couldn't help with that noise. Um, earlier on, last video, we talked about this 100 hertz low cut switch. Sometimes this is called LC or just low cut. This one just says 100 hertz with a little line over top. So we're taking the low end and getting rid of it. This is essentially a bass control. 100 hertz is a bass frequency. 
we use to think about audio, think about sound, it's composed of frequencies. So this actually, this little guy here is technically part of the equalizer. It is, a, it is another standalone equalizer function. It's like a secondary one of these set of these knobs built in and it just does one job. The manual of this mixer will specify the severity of this low cut. Um, and the reason why it's low, it says, because it's 100 hertz. If we're thinking about audio frequencies from a physics sort of standpoint, science sort of standpoint, it uses, uh, sound uses a logarithmic scale. As humans, we can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, otherwise known as 20K. So 20 to 20K is the spectrum of a, like a, kind of like a newborn baby, young kid sort of hearing ability, can hear that sort of level. Now, as we get older, we end up losing some of the stuff around oh, get, maybe go down all the way to 10K if you have really bad hearing. You can lose a lot of the really high frequencies. Um, we're gonna talk about more about that in just a second. So the, re the way you can tell that this, this uh, button here is a low cut control is because 100 hertz, 100 hertz is way closer to 20 than it is to 20,000. Um, so it's, okay, it's gotta have to do something to do with bass, have something to do with low frequencies. And they also have this little kind of line. It looks like a little, uh, like a, fraction sort of graph here, or uh, a little bit of like a straight line with an angle. It's describing the EQ shape. So you can think of equalizers as a graphical sort of interface. Um, and we'll come back in part 2B with a, a picture of that, drawing of that. So you can go ahead and pause that real quick. Um, all right, we're back with part 2B. I had to grab some drawing paper here because I want to explain what this low cut does here. So as you can tell, it's a little line like this, and it says 100 hertz right here. So the line they have here, that's a usually like a very common thing with analog consoles to have this symbol of some sort. This means low cut. So we're taking low end and we're getting rid of it. Graphically speaking, we're talking like, let's say volumes on our y-axis, pitch or frequency is on the x you can think of it this way. Very common to see frequency response diagrams with 20 hertz. So if you can hertz down here. Very common to see 20 on the low end and then 20,000 or 20K on the high end. And this would just be volume up here. So this low cut switch we have is taking 100 hertz, which would be right here on our spectrum, our logarithmic scale. That's why the numbers get crazy, even though it's actually not as far apart as you might think. 100 hertz in the scale, and it starts attenuating or reducing the volume, all the frequency content below 100 hertz. So what that means is essentially you're getting rid of bass. If somebody sounds really boomy like this and you put a low cut on, it may go back to normal and sound like this. If you hear the quality of my voice changer, or I'm trying to simulate what having a low cut off sounds like. And then when I stop sounding boomy, it's kind of like putting a low cut switch on it, removing the boominess. Um, for this sound system in particular, when it's working, this switch will be super great for the subwoofer because sometimes with you know bass, bass big voiced guys with lots of bottom end, when they're talking really close to microphone, the microphone will pick that up and almost amplify it too much for us. So if we're wanting to hear them talk, we hear it's, it sounds muffled, you can't understand them. Maybe the subwoofer's really going really loud and crazy. Adding the low cut switch and turning that on will get rid of some of that low rumble and you may be able to hear what they're saying. It's not gonna activate the subwoofer as much um, as otherwise might. So this is going to be your favorite EQ control. This will be so great at solving so many problems. Uh, I remember from the last time I was here, I think I probably depressed a lot of these 100 hertz uh, low cut switches myself, I would be, I'm assuming, or maybe uh, previous sound engineers have, when we had a whole band mix. And what I was thinking is like, well, we have a couple singers, guitars, bass, drums, a lot of low frequencies being produced. Uh, so to get rid of that, to attenuate that, to hear everybody better, that was a, my first spot. That was why I went first. I try to get rid of everything from 100 hertz for a lot of these sound sources. The only thing in a band mix that is, uh, can stay safe from the dreaded low cut switch would be like a computer, you know, playing full tracks that are full frequency. You want to have that bass, a computer, maybe a bass, and maybe like a bass drum, and that's it. Everything else is we can have this low cut switch on for some sounds like for um, like really soprano really really tinny female singers If you put the low cut switch on it's not gonna make a difference It really because they're not producing frequencies down at the bottom end of this spectrum They're not gonna be there we more up in this sort of range this higher range of, of sound um, so 
your favorite switch would be a slow cut switch. When in doubt, try the low cut switch. Uh, you use this first. If you're trying to make something sounds better, usually everything's a little too rumbly, especially in a subwoofer system. Oops. And so you want to try this guy first. Um, we'll talk more about using a low cut switch as part of your homework assignment to be coming after our demo of the, the uh, knobs here. Moving on from there, okay, what if we say, okay, what if we don't want to cut the bass? What if we want to boost the bass? What if we want to make it go up? Or, you know, let's make it a little cleaner drawing. What if we want, if we want it to look like that? Maybe we want to make something more boomier, fatter sounding. What if we want to make it bigger? Well, that's when we go on to our actual equalizer section. So I want to dub, double check if you're going to try out your EQ, these five knobs here, six knobs, excuse me, to make sure to turn it on with a little button. Most how buttons down. Um, some mixers, the EQ is always on. In the case of this one, it's a little more advanced. You can bypass it, which is kind of nice. And we'll talk about why this by EQ bypass or on off switch is going to be really cool. All right, let's talk about these knobs here. We've got HF at the top. It says high mid with two knobs associated with it, low mid, two knobs associated with it, and low frequency. We have a four band equalizer. So this, these four knobs here, five and six knobs. They all correlate to different zones on the frequency spectrum over here. So let's make ourselves a clean graph with our frequency response from 20 all the way to 2,000, 20,000, excuse me. So your high frequency knob, HF, is going to correlate to the really high stuff near 20K. Your high mid control will, will take a zone around this sort of area. Low frequency or low mid, low, low mid, these lower two section knobs will have this sort of range down here, but it's kind of going to overlap a bit with the high mid section. So high mid's over here, low mid section over here, a little, a little bit of overlap. And then you also have this low frequency control at the bottom. So we have about this sort of area. So all together, we have low frequencies, low mids, high mids, and high frequencies, according to your, um, according to your console. Let's, let's put these into context. These are a little confusing. We can think of high frequencies. Let's do the same line here. High frequency, this is like really high treble. So that's pretty much like taking the bass out of it completely. Not quite. We'll get to that in just a second. Good question, though. High treble, this is also can be called presence in this sort of area. So we're thinking, frequency-wise, we're thinking, oh, it's probably about like the 10,000 and higher sort of range, 10K and higher. This is a, a, some people call this treble. I call it presence. I think it's more accurate. Um, we'll go on to more detail in just a second. High mid-range control, that's exactly what I think it is. To me, this is like low treble, low treble, low T, and then high mids. <laughs> sort of range. This is a very kind of definable range. There's a lot of people argue as to what this means. Um, lower mid-range is exactly what it says. It's lower mid-range. Uh, and maybe upper bass. And then low frequencies, think that as your bass. There's actually something called sub-bass. You can call it sub-bass. You can call it resonance. Down here, but we're probably not going to be able to control that too much. So we have four frequency ranges to essentially play with. Most sounds you hear occupy all spectrum have co or have frequency content in all of these different areas. When you hear um, Pastor Ben speak, he's going to have some bass content in his voice. Yeah, that's the boominess in his voice when he's his mic is really close to his face. You know, boom, 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 boom. Like the noise happening in his throat that's really low. That's his, he's going to have some bass in his voice. He's going to have some lower mids. That's where his voice is probably going to live. It's got a little bit of muddiness, a little um, uh, kind of, it's, it can be perceived as bass. That's why you can call it upper bass. Um, kind of extra boominess, but like projects well. A little projecting boom. Uh, higher mid-range, Pastor Ben's going to have some higher mid-range. That's where you're going to really be able to tell what he's saying, the clear kind of the, his, to the high sort of part of his voice where you can really hear what words are and the clarity is in your high mid-range. And he's also going to have this sort of high treble sort of part of his voice where is the S sound, 
and like airy sounds are gonna be in this sort of range. So on these knobs, we can control all the aspects of his voice or any instrument we want to. If you think of it graphically, this is a great way to, I wish they, they made these things horizontal like the graph and in this sort of layout here because if boy, it makes a heck of a lot more sense. So um, now we're gonna get to is your homework as a group or individually is what we wanna do. Is gonna, your homework's gonna be to set this up so maybe this will be before or after you've watched this video. Set up the mixer and set up everything how you normally would for worship. You're gonna take some, a uh, couple different audio files from either computer or some sort of t you know device that can play music. Maybe set up on one or two channel strips. And you're gonna play a pre-recording of like a, maybe somebody doing a podcast, somebody talking right into a microphone, very dry, very low reverb. It can be Pastor Ben, but if it, like, a, like a recorded sermon he's done, we wanna make sure there's no reverb. So stuff on the YouTube channel will not count because <laughs> uh, there's already some reverb in that. That will throw you off. Um, as well as maybe pick a contemporary worship song, like a, something recorded in the last 10, 20 years. Full band, mix, everything's in there. You know, a couple guitars, you know, multiple singers, drums, all strings, whatever. Uh, and you're going to have both of those ready. And as a group, you're going to play it, and you're going to listen to what it sounds like for a couple minutes, each of those sources, and take notes. So when Pastor Ben does his, or whatever your spoken word source is, when you hear that speech, you hear what it sounds like with, with all the EQ disengaged or have all the knobs in neutral position, you're going to analyze the voice. Think, okay, how boomy is this voice? Is, is this voice very boomy? What's the, um, how can I hear the actual words he's saying? What is it? Is it really bright? Is it really dark sounding? How, how loud are the S sounds? And try to, like, write detailed sort of um, description of how you would describe this voice as you hear right now. And then what you're going to do is you're going to engage your EQ. You're going to try taking one of these knobs and you're going to turn it up, maybe up all the way. And you're going to analyze, okay, what happened to the voice? Because this, if you, when this EQ is engaged, it will change this voice. Any one of these knobs, as long as the, any of the level controls. So all these, uh, these darker knobs here. So you turn one of these up, turn them down. Every single knob, you're going to do one, one at a time. You're going to hear that with the EQ essentially bypassed, or turn it off, and you're going to listen to how it sounds. Maybe turn the bass up, turn it on. So what, what changed? Was, is it boomier? Can you hear more low end? Is the subwoofer getting activated? Make critical sort of um, observations about what you're hearing, and then go back and forth multiple times. And everybody takes notes. Everybody should, you should not really talk when you're doing this. I want everybody to be, as a group, writing their own notes, hearing for themselves what is happening. With equalizers, with frequency-dependent controls, with analyzing sounds, whatever it may be, everybody hears things a little bit differently. How I hear the effect of a low-frequency boost may be different than how you hear a low-frequency boost. Depends on what your ears have been exposed to, the kind of music you listen to, the sounds you've been exposed to over the course of your life. It can all kind of affect what these sounds, how this uh, sound um, is changed by adding low frequency, for example. Okay, Alex, so anytime one of these buttons is, is down, that's on, is that correct? Across the board, or, or does it vary? It varies, that's a okay. great question. That's a good question, all right. So in this case, no, this, this would be on, off. Okay. Great question. But for this... You have to push it in, yeah. So pushed in is on, pulled out is off. Okay. Yeah, great All question, right. great question. So anyway, um, as part of your homework, you're, everybody's going to take notes with a boost. Do it a couple times, back and forth. Then you're going to cut it all the way. See what's missing. Is the boominess of the voice gone? What, what happened? What actually happened? Write a detailed report or a couple notes as to what changed when you turn the bass all the way down. Go back to normal. Then move on to your maybe high frequencies. Be careful with this one, don't have it too loud. You're gonna boost the high frequencies up. Listen to it normally first once, clear your mind, clear your brain what you just heard, then turn the high frequencies way up. Be careful with the volume control because this will hurt you. Okay, this usually high frequencies control are placed very high in ear damaging territory. So maybe you might wanna do it like just about there and you might get the same effect. You're gonna notice a huge amount of airiness and sound, you get huge S sounds, it's gonna be really uncomfortable probably with this setting. And then again, do the same thing. Listen, go back and forth between either turning the knob all the way back to middle and boosted a couple times, write some notes. Same thing, cut the highs, see what, what sounds like go back and forth. Low mid and high mid controls, as you can see there are these two little sort of grayed out boxes here. Both of these controls are interactive. So the white knob is gonna select the frequency 
or the point along the graph where you're selecting. So that's why I have this circle here on our sort of diagram. So if this low middle control, this low middle control selects anywhere from, let's say, right here is uh, 80 hertz, that's essentially base, all the way through to 1.9K, which would be way up here. Or 1, uh, 1900 hertz. So you can sweep it. You can change where this EQ control lies or where it's affecting. So um, you want to start, I always start within the middle. Looks like our middle indicator is 450 for this control. Start with it there, boost it, cut it. All the same things we talked about, they're low and high frequency. And I would choose like a couple other, uh, a couple other frequencies in here. So maybe kind of towards 80, boost and cut, and then towards 1.9K, boost and cut. It will change depending on where you have this frequency knob, what you're hearing. What, we, what you're hearing will change depending on where this is pointed and how it affects this control here. So you can't really do every single point in this control because it's going to be too much, too much time wasted there. But you'll get the point. So just play with this one, play with it, see what happens to the sound. Again, to the voice as well as to the band mix. Same with high mids. So if you think of our high mids control, look at the numbers are going from 550 hertz, which is kind of on our graph here about this sort of range. Let's, let's get rid of these guys. 550 hertz all the way up until 13K, which is essentially high end, high trouble and present. So it's way at the top here. So big range of control on this one. Again, be sensitive when you're boosting the signal at a, on a high frequency. Be careful with your ears. You don't want to hurt yourselves, but you just want to hear what happens because there are times you may want to boost high end. Try a couple spots on this white knob, boosting and cutting. So this will, this will be a laborious process, but it's going to be totally worth it. Take notes. Do it, again, for both spoken word for, and for a band, and you'll be surprised at the level of control and the level of um, the things you'll learn about, oh man, that's what that knob does. Oh, okay, when you boost 500, oh man, it makes 550, it makes the guitar sound really thick and meaty. Or, oh, when I, uh, when I boost uh, towards 80 hertz, everything sounds really bassy and boomy. Oh man, or if I boost, uh, boost the high frequencies, man, it sounds, the sound is unbearable. And you'll get similar sort of observations as you're going along. So, especially when you're listening to the full track, let's go back to middle here. Listen to the timbre of all the instruments as you make each individual EQ change. Take some notes. Does it affect the bass? Does it affect cymbals? Does it affect snare drum? Does it affect guitars? Does it affect vocals? What you're doing on the EQ. This is the best way I can think for to learn this because there's all sorts of lessons. You can spend hours talking about how to use an equalizer to make things sound better. But the best way to do it is to listen and hear from your, for yourself. I try and intentionally not give away too many sort of secrets or ideas or concepts to equalize you because everybody's going to hear stuff differently. You have a different set of ears than I do. So what I think sounds good may not, think, may not be the same as what everybody else thinks sounds good. So as a mixer, as a live sound engineer, you get to have some choice. You get to have to play around with, with the sounds you're getting and make them sound better or make them work nicer together. Um, I'll be providing Ben or Jim with some links to some like YouTube channels that kind of go into more in depth on how to use EQ for mixing and kind of more advanced mixing concepts as well as we'll do today. But this is a sound shaper. So when in doubt, just turn it off. Make sure that button's up. But if you're ready to have a play, if you, if you attend the sort of listening session, then every sound source except for pretty much the computer, really, you can turn it on and make things sound a little better. But that will not work with laptop song off. It will work with everything you put into it. It will just not sound good. Usually everything on the laptop will be pre-mixed for you. It will already sound great. That's right. why recording music sounds great. It sounds big and full. You can hear everything. Because some other audio engineer during the recording process has made EQ moves and uh, affected the tone of other instruments with other equalizers already for you. You know, for a computer, if like maybe the sub is too boomy or not boomy enough, you can use the low frequency control. Turn on and use that and turn it up. Um, or maybe sounds, everything just sounds really bright. At, no matter what the song is, maybe you can turn the high frequencies down a little bit. Um, you, can, you can EQ it, but I would not recommend it because usually everything is pre-done. But when you're uh, mixing a band or speech or people talking on microphones, that is unmixed audio. might not be the right... This, the raw sound coming out of the, into the microphone might not be the right sound for this space. With an EQ, you can make things sound better, you can make things sound worse, you can make things sound more or less reverbious, actually. Um, 
at my church, I, at one point I was able to make whoever was talking essentially negate the effect of the reverb just using equalizer, which is not a common thing because it's a very reverbious place, but I want to make it sound clear. So with a little bit of training, I was able to do that. I'm not expecting you to be able to do that because it's going to take a lot of experience, a lot of playing. But with this training session you guys, you're going to do, hopefully that will help. Um, you'll see these knobs and hear things. Oh, not enough S sounds. You'll, you'll go to maybe your high mid control and you'll turn it up. Too many S sounds. Maybe you'll go to high mid control, turn it down. Or everything's just a little too bright. Go to your high frequency, turn the brightness down. You'll start he hearing things happening in the sounds you are using for worship. You'll say, oh, I bet you I can make that sound better to my ears. I bet you I can make that sound less abrasive, more warm, more comforting, easier to hear, more clear. So use, use these adjectives when you're analyzing your sound sources, your spoken word and your band. You're making things, when something happens to the equalizer, is it making it better? Is it making it worse? Um, in the band context, it, when you're listening to the recorded band, it will make things sound worse and that's okay, but hear the effect of that. So when you have multiple instruments going, you may want to turn down all the bass in a lot of the instruments you're hearing. And maybe the bass guitar needs more bass. And maybe the, uh, the snare drum is too dark, so I'm going to boost the high end a little bit like tons of boot, high end boost, or um, maybe all the guitars are kind of competing with the bass. Maybe you want to fight, fight the, uh, fight the bass, make sure the bass and guitars can both be heard independently as well. So in no time with a little practice, a little playing around, a little bit of um, anal analyzing, taking notes, you can then use your notes and reverse engineer what you did. So if you hear something, like, oh man, when I boosted low end, it made everything sound too boomy. Well, maybe you want, if you want, think something sounds too boomy, in, when you're mixing, check your notes. Oh, you turn the low frequencies down. Boom. You have notes. You can prepare yourself. You can have this little cheat sheet move over here or up here, and you can just, oh, okay, it sounds too dark. High frequencies, turn them up. Or maybe it might be, okay, I want to hear the guitars better. Maybe one about 1K, 1 1,000 hertz or so. Let's turn that up. So on and so forth. The art of playing with it in a safe context so nobody's here. You can make everything sound terrible, which it will sound terrible will be the best way to learn this. So um, I encourage everybody, the folks here, to do this once, maybe more, multiple times occasionally, just to get a refresher course, try multiple different songs, multiple different sort of sound sources. You know, it's, it's all fair game. Um, and uh, with a little bit of practice, you'll be able to make things sound better, just with an equalizer. Um, as far as upgrades, when we come to the next part of our video series here, uh, there's other audio tools as well besides an equalizer that are standalone units that can improve the sound of things like a compressor or maybe an effects unit, that sort of thing. But if you have an e equalizer built in every single channel strip, um, with a little confidence, if, when you use it, you'll make things sound a lot better. Uh, so that's about it. All right, so let's, this is part, I don't know, four-ish or so, of it, maybe three of this uh, our audio training here at Unhindered Church. Uh, so we're going to talk about noises and things that are good, things that are bad. Um, now, we're not going to be able to demonstrate all these today. Maybe we'll do that in another part of this video or some other time. But uh, I can just talk you through things that are you are common and that are okay and things that are less common, less okay. Um, usually, unplanned, loud, bad noises are bad. Yes, that is, that is the thing. And so you want to address that. Um, and it is common. You know, the, your mixer and your audio equipment, it's not like your iPhone or your, your Android phone. Where everything just kind of works together and everything plays nice. And you open up the app store, it always works around the internet and that sort of thing. It's, it's not going to go wrong very often. But sometimes if the knobs push too far one way or uh, too, too, something's too quiet, too loud, it can cause issues. And that's okay. But they're fixable. Um, so let's talk about noises that are good. Um, some static is okay. Now you have to figure out where the static is coming from. Is it usually you're going to hear it into your some speakers and your monitors. Um, if you turn off everything, make sure everything's on muted. So all these lights are on. Maybe the master, master fader, fader mix is, is all, all the way off. Even if turn the whole entire mixer off just with the power switch and see, and if you just hear the speakers on by themselves, they're making a little bit of sort of noise and stuff. That's pretty much okay. Um, that's essentially the sound of current passing through the circuitry and kind of it kind of escapes out the speaker a little bit. Um, and that's usually fine. Uh, usually, a most speakers, most amplifiers are usually noisy in some area, especially if they've been used a little bit 
If they're brand new and well powered, usually no. But oh, there's essentially nothing audible. But usually, if anything that's been used a little bit, it might create a little noise, and it should be really, really quiet, and that's perfectly fine. Um, good noises. If you have a guitar player, this is a big one. Uh, hopefully, your electric guitarist knows what what they're doing and they understand their instrument. But sometimes guitars make noise by themselves when they're not doing anything, especially electric guitar players. Um, if a guitar player is using what's called single coil pickups, if they have like essentially where they're playing, you see like vertical lines of like magnets, just single vertical lines, could be two vertical lines of just single skinny lines of magnets or three. Those are usually probably using a single coil pickup. If you see a, a Stratocaster, a Telecaster, that's your indicator that, oh, that's, that's a guitar player with single coil pickups. Depending on what pickup they're using on their guitar, it can generate noise called 60 second hum. It's like, eh, it's just always there. Eh, it kind of sounds about there. Eh, maybe a little bit lower. Eh, <laughs> and it's just always there. Whenever they're using that pickup, it's always going to be there and just be just on their sound and then it's going to come to you. They're going to bring that noise with them. And that's okay. That's a good noise. That's part of the single coil sound. That's part of, if you, it's probably hard to hear on a record because usually on, on, um, in studios, usually your producers maybe try to take that frequency out a little bit or they'll try to denoise everything a little bit before it hits the recording. But if you listen real carefully to old recordings, maybe like of Stevie Ray Vaughan or famous <coughs> Strat or Telecaster players, when they're loud, maybe distorted, you can hear a bit of this, eh, if they, take, they stop playing for a second, sometimes you can hear that. And that's a good noise to have. If you see a guitar player maybe using a Les Paul, um, or something like that, and they'll have these square boxes, these square lines of magnets when they're, around where they're playing. Those are called humbucking pickups, and you shouldn't have this noise with those pickups. You should not have that noise. It should be very clean sounding. If you're hearing a lot of noise, like, eh, or, uh, like crazy loud, very consistent, very loud, from a, somebody with a humbucking pickup, that may be a problem. It's possible, is, if you can tell it's just for, from them, you can tell by the mixer that's just coming from the guitar player. That may mean that some of the potentiometers, some of the knobs they have in their guitar to control things, may not be soldered correctly together, or maybe the solder points are becoming loose, or that their cable's not connecting to the, uh, the ground like it should, their actual instrument cable. So that, that's going to be their issue they're, they're going to have to deal with. They're going to have to figure out some sort of arrangement. Um, so... That's usually a, a good noise. Usually from a guitar player, it's a good thing. It is possible to get those sort of hums. You usually call it ground loop is the, is the kind of term for it. With other things too, um, especially direct boxes. So if your guitarist is plugging to a direct box before it goes into the snake, before it hits the mixer, there's usually a ground lift switch on the direct box. And using that switch can maybe either help the, can usually help the uh, signal sound a little better in case there's a ground, electronic ground loop being created with the instrument being plugged in. Um, so usually the ah sound is good when it's just like electric guitar. Sometimes acoustic as well, depending on the pickup that the acoustic has. But usually it's a good thing if it's quiet and it's just that instrument. If you're hearing it everywhere, so maybe a multiple channel strips or through one speaker and it's always there, ah, that's usually a problem. Again, that could be like a solder point getting a little bit gross or... Um, Usually it can be um, like, a, like a ground plug from the power going from the wall to the speaker might not be adequate or might not be correct or might be too low. Um, and so only electric guitar players, that'd be a good thing. Um, we'll get into solutions, noise solutions. The power is a really good one in just a minute here. Um, other good noises. Uh, echo. So if, if something sounds if like a lot of microphones are on, there's a little extra echo and stuff happening or like sounds a little mushy maybe not maybe the band is playing and they're not using the equalizers not being really used sometimes things just sound a little mushy and kind of reverberous and that's fine right if you clap and there's a bunch of microphones on it gets it's a really loud clap or it sounds like a really roomy clap that's okay um because that just means microphones are on that some people consider that bad noise to keep things quiet you usually want to try to mute mute your uh uh, channel strips or turn your faders down one of the two or that sort of thing that can be a bad noise um, so but that's, it can also be good noise as well the bad noises the number one that I could see happening here the number one noise I see happening right now is potential feedback if somebody's talking to a microphone uh, it's possible that the sound of that microphone 
going through the system out the speakers the sound will go into back into the microphone and so their pitches they'll start to oscillate and get louder and louder and louder until you turn the microphone down turn the channel strip off etc just because of the way the speakers are placed that's called feedback that's a bad noise you don't want that to happen It'll, it will come very quickly and usually be very very powerful um, if you're getting signs of feedback, you might hear if somebody is saying particular words or using the S sounds or um, to staying too close to the subwoofer maybe, or uh, it's, it happens once in a while, you may hear the, the, the onset of feedback or you hear like extraneous like notes or frequencies, kind of notes happening. When maybe maybe it's when somebody's talking, you hear this extra or extra mm, sort of mm, sound happening while they're talking at the ends of their phrases or kind of creeps in and goes away. That means that that microphone or the is on like the onset of feedback. Maybe there's a little bit of feedback happening, but it's not quite loud enough to start oscillating. If if you hear that and you turn it up, you will get some crazy like like that that note used to be really really loud and crazy and out of control. So if you start to hear that, that's your warning sign. If you're hearing extra like notes coming from nowhere when somebody is talking, especially, that's usually some feedback starting to happen. Um, to get rid of feedback, there's a couple things you can do. Um, Ideally, it's going to be the placement of the speakers. You can change the placement of the speakers or the, uh, or the singer or the speaker is standing, and that can help get rid of it. Uh, I don't think this mixer has one, but sometimes you can do what's called flip the phase of the signal, which I don't think this mixer has. So maybe a standalone piece of equipment would be able to do this for you. The phase of an audio signal, if we think of... Uh, is there handy dandy? goes along you can kind of plot it out graphically like this loud softer louder softer and that's how your ears hear sound essentially you can think of this as a compression or rarefaction of the air molecules as they go to your ear the phase of an audio signal is okay when does the, the signal get louder and softer so, the, so two signals that are in phase would look like this two identical waveforms. So if you're getting creating feedback, for example, this is getting put in and creating this and it's getting added together. So it may go from this to something crazy like that. Oh man, that's really loud and terrible. And so it just keep growing and growing and growing. That's where you get the volume from. So if you flip the phase of an audio signal, you're essentially creating the opposite signal. I'll try to draw as best as I can here. You're creating the polar opposite, and you're essentially negating these two signals, so the output is essentially nothing, is what you're trying to do. It doesn't actually work like that, but you'll change the sound, hopefully you reduce it. Um, you may have to consult. The main, there might be a way to flip the phase that I'm just not seeing, but usually it's on a, each channel strip, and uh, so you can adjust that as needed. Flipping the phase is common. Um, for recording studios, you just have phase switches in case to try to get microphones synced up to all sound good. Um, but yeah, if something is feeding back, you can flip the phase. You also turn it down. Um, uh, and but it's, if you don't have, it turns out you don't have a phase reversal switch. You can use an equalizer to figure it out. This is a skill that will take you a little bit of time to kind of maybe trial and error to essentially sweep through with a mid-range control probably your high mids, but it could be your low mids. You're gonna sweep around with a little bit of a boost and you're gonna see if you can find the point where it feeds back the most or it gets really loud or the extra notes get too loud or unbearable. If you turn away from it, maybe it goes away. Go back to this one spot and you hear it with the boost in. Let's pretend all our other knobs are being used. So now we've made that frequency feedback. All you need to do, leave the frequency control there and turn it down. Might need to go down quite substantially depending on how loud the feedback is. That's essentially what you're doing is you're taking on our graph, you're taking that one frequency, that one part of the entire sound, and we're getting rid of it. We're reducing the volume of it. So that way it's getting reamplified by the system. It's not going up to the point where it's feeding back. Um, I've done this many times. It works really well, especially in a live scenario. Um, now, what's good is, uh, I'm assuming you guys still use like a lot of wireless mics and stuff. We do, yeah, we have. Wireless mics, yep, wireless mics are great because what happens with the wireless mic is analog or real-time audio source being captured by the microphone, completely continuous waveform, graphically speaking, very smooth, just like there are examples here, very smooth getting into the microphone. And then that, that clear audio form, let's see if I can draw it right here. Oops, I'm do that. Okay, this clear audio waveform 
then it gets kind of sampled by the device. And it gets kind of turned into like this, like a bunch of dots or like a grid or a bunch of little rectangles, essentially chunking out what you're hearing and converting it to like a radio frequency. So that can help. The conversion of an analog continuous signal into a digital realm can also help with feedback in some instances. Now, if the feedback is really powerful, it might be like a higher frequency or something really high, it might not solve it, not guaranteed. Um, but I haven't had a wireless mic feedback on me that I can remember. Wireless mics, though, lead up me on to our next source, uh, next source excuse me, of bad noise. Wireless mics can interfere with radio signals, radio TV signals, that sort of thing. So um, you assume you guys have like a transmitter, like a, like a pack and then a receiver for that transmitter, right? Like a two sort of... For the FM system. transmitter? Yeah. Yeah, it's in that brown box. Okay. Yep. So... Oh, I'm sorry. This is... Oh, that's, that's our mics in there. Yep. I totally didn't see that. So let's see what we've got in our wireless mics. Or am I, am I wrong? Shut. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. Here we go. So we got a, usually a transmitter and then a receiver together. Um, the problem with wireless mics is that they, again, they can interfere with local radio signals and that sort of thing. So um, there are online sort of helpers to figure out in your area, so in the in Sturgis, where, what kind of radio signals you can and can't use. There's sometimes free sources available. You kind of have to dig for them. Um, if you go to sweetwater.com and search on their knowledge base for like radio signal finder, they usually have to give you the link to where you can find um, essentially maps of where the radio signals are, what frequencies are where. Mm. So sometimes if you're getting a lot of interference, which would be like crackling sounds, things cutting in and out sporadically when you're doing nothing to the, the mixer, that sort of thing, um, or just like crackly sounds are usually really, really loud. Um, sometimes it can look, sound like feedback. Sometimes it's more just like brief kind of cuts in and out. Maybe if you stand right in one spot, it works and sometimes another spot you get the crackly sound it's really bad that's usually indicated that there's a wireless sort of interference happening so um ways to kind of prevent this or fix it is to try to reduce the amount of signals phone signals and stuff happening in a particular area or use setting the transmitter receiver to a, a frequency that's definitely not near where the like radio stations are or tv signals that sort of thing some uh, receivers are sensitive to more sensitive cell phones than others. Um, at one of the local high schools um, by me, their radio pack receivers for their wireless mics or theater program is very sensitive to other cell phones in the room. They're very, they're maybe the, where the, wherever the range that they're set at is very close to cell phone signals. They have everybody turn off cell phones as much as possible. And so when everybody turns their phone off, the uh, the mics work well, nothing cuts out, nothing goes crazy. There's like essentially zero problems. But when a lot of people have their phones on, there's interference or stuff cutting in and out or weird sounds happening quite frequently. So uh, luckily with, with uh, wireless microphones, it's kind of like a set and forget sort of thing. If you get the transmitter the right frequency, it sounds good. Never any interference, it's usually fine. Now without asking Ben, it's probably fine already or pretty, pretty good, but it's, it's always good to double check it does take a little bit of online sort of research to figure out what's good, what's not, but um, that can happen, maybe depending on the day. Maybe somebody's got strange cell phone service or a new cell tower goes up or something like that in this area, you might want to check that. Um, for example, I know one of the microphones at my church has a really bad, has like a sweet spot where if you go to that one spot in the sanctuary, boom, you get crazy noise, it just cuts out, it's really gross. So that, that I have to, I'll have to reset that transmitter frequency at some point in the near future. Um, let's see. Now we're on to our next bad noise. Um, <laughs> sta again, static. Really, really overpowering static usually is a sign that something is not getting, that maybe the mixer's not getting signal, but you're trying to bring signal to the mixer. So you have the input gains turned up or you have the faders turned up really high. As you add gain, as you add volume, as you add level, more noise is created, usually by default, with especially any analog system. Um, and so this can be a good thing, but usually it's not a bad thing. If you have, especially things turn up a lot, 
you know, or a crazy loud, everything's really loud and something's not working, you, you, something should be working, you can get in and introduce lots of really loud static by having things turned up too high. So you want to be careful with that. So if something seems like it's too quiet, then maybe, okay, what's some, maybe go to the source and see if you can figure out what's happening there. Maybe something's not plugged in all the way. Maybe there's like a loose connection in the snake or something like that. Maybe it's, maybe there's something got unsoldered somewhere or something's a little too loose, et cetera. Um, so just be careful about making anything too loud. If you make something too loud, you'll get more static. So you, as best as you possibly can, you want to keep things quiet. You have, give things um, a volume range to before clipping. So remember, volume range, a good acceptable range of volume before it can distort for all your signals usually keeps the noise down. So we want to keep the, again, volume big, wide range before clipping helps with lower that staticky sort of noise. Um, this can be a uh, part, this can uh, kind of create itself or be more apparent with electric guitars as well. The guitar players will intentionally use distortion and clipping based effects for their tone. And so if you hear just when the guitar player plays all the time, that's a good thing. Usually it's, it's just sound pretty sweet actually. But sometimes if they're, maybe they have a standalone effects board or pedals or something like that, or an amplifier with, with overdriving or right overdrive, it may just be noisy just by itself. And usually that's a good thing. Hopefully your guitar player is smart enough to have figure that noise issue out, or maybe trying not to run as much distortion or finding cleaner sounding effects and amplifiers that don't create as much background hiss and noise and stuff. But sometimes they haven't done that. And you, it's kind of, you kind of have to live with it. That's the sound they really like. Then you might have to just live with that noise coming from the guitar players. Um, if you're getting like weird hisses and stuff from the keyboard, mm, maybe you want to check the, make sure nothing's set too loud or too quiet or anything like that. Um, so that's our section on noises. All right. All right. Then under the last part, I forgot one thing. Um, sometimes noises, hums, loud things that are constant, static, that are always kind of there sometimes can be reduced or improved or even removed through powering properly. Um, I wish I had known the importance of powering equipment properly a long time ago. I think it would save me so many hassles. But um, I always noticed how when I was at Western, I got my recording degree, essentially it's called Multimedia Arts Technology from Western. All the recording studios use what's called power or called power conditioners. They're essentially devices, usually audio rack sized, which would be 19 inches wide, usually from the brand Furman. And they are essentially like fancy power strips. And what a power conditioner does is it does what well, power, it delivers power to everything. It kind of does clean power off, clean power on, use more than some built in switches on devices would do. It can also filter out radio noise and other noise that can be happening and also tries to sometimes can act as like a generator to make sure the stuff is getting a constant strong current. If the power in this room is not very good, so which is very common in different venues, maybe the voltage coming out of the wall isn't whatever is it one, like 120, I think is the, the standard. Maybe it's a little bit lower or something like that. The power conditioner can help regulate that stuff. So without a power conditioner, you might be getting iffy voltages coming out of the wall, it might not be constant to what your equipment will need. And usually what happens to um, things that amplify sound electronically. So mixers and speakers and guitar amplifiers and effects, that sort of thing. Usually what happens is you get a reduction in volume, your reduction in headroom. So let's go a little graph of headroom here. Think of a vertical sort of graph as headroom. So essentially, it's like a, just like one of these guys here, your, your meters, your electrical meters. This, you think of this as like an example of headroom. So all the way down would be like a super quiet, infinitely quiet, and all up would be as loud as possible. So it'd be like this is essentially the level of distortion. So this would be essentially silence. So essentially, just silence down here. And then all the way up would be distortion, or point of distortion, or clipping. So your audio signal... Neat, uh, when working well, has is is somewhere between both of these. It's oscillating, getting different levels between this point of silence and point of clipping at all times. When you uh, don't have enough power, what happens is the point of clipping gets reduced. And when you lose power, again, it shrinks down. So when you try to put audio signals that are loud through here, you can create distortion, you can create noise. And what also happens is, perceptually, the silence down here is going to be noise. 
Usually you never get things completely silently unless it's real powered. Sometimes when you have stuff too quietly or too loud, you can start hearing staticky noise. When the power gets lowered, the perceived noise will go up. So you may hear if stuff sounds like eh, like lots of sort of eh, or sort of sounds are getting are really loud one particular day. You're not sure why if everything's working like normal and you're not using any power conditioning. Uh, and you, you may discover that stuff will distort or not, or maybe too noisy than normally is. It could be a power thing from the venue that you maybe aren't able to control. So most professional sort of grade audio systems, whether it's racks of effects, mixer systems, microphone systems, powering of instruments, that sort of thing. If they're smart, I don't know why these aren't, everybody doesn't have one of these, is to have a power conditioner or multiple sets of power conditioners that are kind of filtering out, you know, interference, radio issues, power hums, giving a constant voltage, is regulating the voltage, and makes everything run really with as much headroom, as much dynamic range and volume range as possible, without, and reducing the noise level as much as possible, getting us the highest point of clipping sort of available. And when everything is working right, you should have that full dynamic range available. When everything's powered properly, usually on a good day, it's no big deal. But say maybe somebody has a lot of stuff plugged in on their side of the building or stuff being used outside and it plugged into the building. It's all on the, like, the same circuit. It could be too much current draw for the building to handle. It's so everything's getting starved of voltage. And so you're, lo you're losing the potential volume range before noise that you had before. Um, so I, I don't think you guys have any power conditioners. Mm -mm. So the, the, as far as the one piece of equipment I think that, that I've seen so far that really needs to get purchased as like an upgrade or as a, more of a safety tool is maybe one or two, two power conditioners, maybe one for maybe instruments up front and then one back here for the mixer and stuff like that. But it's just a fancy power strip. It doesn't seem like it do, does that much and it seems overpriced because they usually run about $100 or more for a Furman brand one, which is my favorite brand but they can really help clean things up and make things sound better. When I was in my lone powered, battery powered environments, the power conditioner at least helped things make it a little bit less noisy. Now we still did not have nearly enough voltage, nearly enough oomph from these car batteries to power the equipment I was using at the time, but it made it better, clean things up a little bit. And whenever I'm in a recording studio, professional grade one, or a home studio that's professional of any context, there's always a power conditioner because Electric equipment takes a lot out of the wall, especially audio equipment can suck a, a lot of power out. It can be put a, put a strain on it. And so to have something to protect as well as to filter and to kind of supply the current necessary for audio-based equipment, a power conditioner is great. So um, if you don't have things with a power conditioner, you can create more noise. So um, for this church, I'd recommend to try a power conditioner in a couple different places and see if that just lowers the noise for make things a little bit loud without less static or less hum and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Now is there a special